What's up guys, my name is Mark Steiner and this is my long-term review of the Sony a7S III. I've had this camera since launch day and I have used it on every video shoot since then. Every YouTube video, every personal project, every client project, everything involving video I have shot on this camera since September 24th, 2020. And this camera is absolutely amazing. Let's start with the body. It has a nice deep grip that feels really good in the hand and it feels a lot more balanced compared to previous gen Sony cameras, especially with longer, heavier lenses attached to it. My personal favorite change is the flip out touchscreen. And this thing is so helpful when you're out in the wild. Not only does it flip out so you can frame yourself up for vlogging or when you're on a gimbal, you can actually frame and see what you're doing depending on whatever angle you're at that is so helpful in and of itself but now it is a actual functioning touchscreen not like previous gen sony cameras where they were called touchscreens but you couldn't actually do anything with them this you can do everything with you can go through the menus you can adjust focus you can do focus tracking and it is so helpful i find myself using it for focusing and focus tracking all the time. I'm so glad Sony listened. This is exactly what we needed in a video focus camera. It's not the highest quality display. It's not the brightest either, but when you're out and about running and gunning, you don't want to have a giant monitor alongside you. And this does the job good enough that you know that your exposure and your framing are right. And that's what really matters. The S3 also features the best EVF that Sony has ever made. And I almost never use that because this is for me a dedicated video camera. And I find myself only using the flip out touch screen. There is now a dedicated record button on the top and you can also trigger recording with the shutter release which is awesome. The body now also features a full-size HDMI port for external recording and monitoring and that is so helpful. I'm so glad that Sony listened to the community and got rid of that micro HDMI garbage. This is just such a much more reliable connection and I'm glad that they decided to put this on the camera. The S3 can now be powered by USB-C. On previous gen cameras they accepted USB-C pass-through with power but it always trickled the battery life down and it never was a huge improvement you would just get a little bit more time but with this you can now actually power the camera and fully rely on it and not run out of battery life so that is very helpful if you're doing longer recordings and only have one battery you can use a USB-C battery bank or a dedicated USB-C wall charger and that will work fine another thing I've noticed on the s3 is that the audio is a lot better not only is the internal mic sounding a lot richer than previous gen cameras but when you plug in external mics they sound a lot better so I think that the preamps on this are much better than previous gen cameras. I was putting my audio settings on my A7R3 between 10 and 15 depending on the situation with an external mic and with that same mic I'm putting that audio setting on 7 with the S3 so clearly better audio is being had because I don't need to have the volume up as high so that's pretty impressive. Another huge change on the S3 is the brand new card slots. Not only does it take SD cards you can now use the brand new CF Express type A cards and this is huge. This new card slot is so helpful because it allows the consumer to choose what card they want to use. They can use SD cards or they can use CF Express type A and it really depends on your budget and what features really are important for you. If you're going to be using SD cards with this camera I highly recommend you get V90 cards because those can actually keep up with the video speed of this camera. All of my current SD cards can't so that's a deal breaker for me. I am however using the CF Express Type A cards because my mentality is if you're going to buy the Ferrari you got to get the good gas and I just want that peace of mind knowing I'm getting the best of the best for the best camera on the market. One of the things I was really surprised about is I personally bought the 160 gigabyte CF Express Type A card and even with that 160 gigabytes I was only getting one hour and 25 minutes of 4K 24 FPS 422 10-bit recording and that just kind of blew my mind that 160 gigabytes is only getting me an hour and 25. So just be aware that these file sizes are absolutely massive and you're gonna have to keep that in mind while shooting. This camera features some pretty insane frame rates. You have the usual like 24 and 30, but now you can do 4K 60, 4K 120, and 1080 at 240 frames per second. So that's absolutely insane that you can get that kind of slow motion out of a camera in such high quality. For me, that's a game changer. The one thing I do have to say about these frame rates is that up to 4K 60, you can pick which codec you want to shoot in but when you start shooting in 4k 120 you are locked into that h265 codec which is much harder on your computer 
let's get into that. This camera features multiple codecs and the one that I choose to shoot in is the SI codec. This is the best overall codec because you're getting that 422 10-bit, but it also allows you to actually edit your footage without proxies if you have a powerful enough computer. The codec I'm really interested in though is the H.265 codec. Unless I'm shooting 120, I avoid this at all costs because it's just too hard on your editing machine. However, in the near future, Apple is going to be releasing those M1X or M2 Max, and those are going to have an onboard H.265 accelerator chip, and that is going to allow you to actually edit H.265 footage without your computer completely going to crap. Now, the reason I'm so interested in this H.265 codec is because you get the same quality video but the file sizes are literally halved. So that means instead of getting an hour and 25 minutes recording, I can get two hours and 50 minutes of recording using that H.265 codec. And that is a game changer for long-term storage, but also shoot times. And I think this is so helpful for the near future. And I'm glad that Sony included this future-proofing this camera for when editing machines actually catch up to being able to utilize H.265. Another new feature that I love on the S3 is that you can now dial in your preferred AF settings. You now have the ability to dial in either subject shift sensitivity or transition speed, and that is super helpful depending on the kind of situation you're shooting. For a talking headshot like this, I have them both on the lowest setting because it's just going to be locked onto my eye and it's not going to be looking for other subjects and it's just going to be focused on me and there's going to be none of that weird focus racking going on where it thinks it might need to be focusing on something else. However, if you're in a high speed situation where you need to be tracking a runner or a high speed car or multiple subjects in a crowd, you can change and dial in those exact settings depending on what you're shooting. So that is very helpful that they give you the option and the choice because now you can pick depending on your situation. Now let's talk about the most important part of this camera, the sensor. This thing I have no words to describe how incredible this sensor is. This is my first time using a S-Line camera and this thing blew my expectations. I knew this was a video focus camera with amazing low light sensitivity, but I was mind blown that I could be at 640 ISO with a 1.8 lens and it looked like daylight. I was perfectly exposed. I was shooting 120 4K FPS in pitch black at night and it was usable. You just don't get that on any other camera. Like the, you're getting incredible low noise performance in low light and it's it's mind blowing. Pair that with the amazing AF and you can just rely on this camera in any situation. And not only does this camera thrive in low light situations and that's what so many people love about this camera, but I think what not enough people are talking about is that not only is this the low light king, but that means that in every other scenario, it becomes more helpful. If you're in a non-ideal lighting situation, you can now make it usable, even though it's not ideal. Whereas other cameras, you just have to not do that or bring professional lights. And with this camera, because of its low light sensitivity, you don't actually need very powerful lights. I've lit scenes with my tiny Aperture MC light and it looked amazing. It looked like a viable key light. So you don't need these huge, big professional lights in order to use this camera. You can use tiny, small, affordable lights with not much output and still get a very professionally lit scene. So that is very helpful in a wide variety of scenarios. And that's why I think this camera is not only the best in low light, but it's just the best all round, most versatile camera for any situation because it will just automatically make any situation better. Speaking of ISOs, this camera has dual native ISO. I did a whole video on this and it's absolutely insane that you can now pick between two native ISOs and your image just cleans up like crazy. So on S-Log3, that is 640 and 12,800, and I'm only really shooting S-Log3 because that's the best picture profile to get the most out of this camera. I very rarely find myself using ISOs between that. I will change my other settings or ND based around those two native ISOs because I want the cleanest image possible. If in a very dire situation, I find myself needing to bump up my ISO just a little bit, I will, but for the most part, I stick to those two numbers, 640 and 12,800. Now, the reason I'm able to shoot S-Log3 on this camera is because of that 422 10-bit. For the first time in a Sony camera, we're getting 10-bit video, and that is astronomically so helpful for post-production and having that flexibility. And most people might 
think the jump from 8-bit to 10-bit is not that big. 8-bit has 16.7 million colors. Sounds like a lot. Then you jump to 10-bit and it has over a billion colors. That's an astronomical difference in the amount that you can do. And this is why S-Log on previous gen cameras always absolutely fell apart because of that 8-bit codec, it just couldn't handle S-Log. But now with 10-bit, it can, and you're getting a beautiful image that you can really do a lot with in post. This camera features some brand new stabilization modes that I use all the time. The first one is the active mode, which does a 1.1 times crop and then stabilizes the footage in body. And that is so helpful because everything is just smooth. And I did multiple videos on the brand new stabilization. So check that out if you're interested. And I'm personally always keeping it in active mode because this is just so smooth, whether handheld or on a gimbal, I absolutely love active mode. It's just that built-in stabilization, so helpful and it just looks great. The other new form of stabilization on this camera is the brand new gyro data stabilization in Catalyst Browse. This is so helpful for a lot of people, but I personally almost never use it because you have to break the 180 shutter angle rule in order to utilize this. And that means no built-in stabilization. So it's all done in post and you have to crop in quite a bit to actually get it stabilized. In my tests, it's very good stabilization. It looks great. It looks like you're using a gimbal when you're not. And that's mind blowing. But in order to do that, you have to crank up your shutter speed. And I don't like to do that because I like that natural motion blur. And depending on your situation, there can still be some weird artifacting going on. It's not distracting for the most part and most people aren't going to notice it, but I notice it and I don't like it. And since you're going to be cropping in post, you're actually losing some of that resolution, which I'm not a fan of because in order to get that super smooth video, you have to crop in quite a bit and you can dial in how much cropping you want based on how stabilized you want the footage to be, but you're actually losing resolution every time you do this. And I found the sweet spot for me was somewhere around 75 to 85% cropped in. So you're losing quite a bit of resolution on that and it really bogs down your workflow because when you're doing that in Catalyst Browse, it's not the most optimized and you have to do it for each individual clip. And when you're doing that, it's just, I personally don't like doing it because it really is not helpful for what I like to shoot. In certain circumstances, I would find that very helpful, but I am not using this as my main form of stabilization. Now with all these amazing new features like the autofocus, the touchscreen, the EVF, as well as the brand new codex, you might start to wonder, is this going to take a hit on battery life? And yes, there is a massive hit on battery life. It's not horrible. You can still use these Z batteries and expect a good amount of shooting with it, but it's not like the previous gen cameras. You're going to have to take multiple batteries with you on a shoot. You can't rely on just one battery. I personally have four batteries now between my two cameras, so that's very helpful. But I always like to have three batteries just in case anything happens. And whereas on my R3, I could rely on one, maybe one and a half batteries for an all day shoot. With this one, you really need multiple batteries to get through a day's worth of shooting. Now, I know I've been talking about mostly the video features on this camera, and to me, this is a dedicated video camera. It does so happen to take photos, and I actually really love the photos out of this camera. They look great. Most people assume that 12 megapixels isn't enough for photography, but for social media, it's more than enough. And the more I look into it, your prints look absolutely amazing. I was recently watching a video by Chris Howe how he was comparing a 12 megapixel photo taken on this camera to a 100 megapixel taken on a medium format camera. And no one could tell the difference. They genuinely thought the 12 megapixel shot looked better. So clearly Sony is doing some amazing image quality sharpening whatever in camera and it just looks so good in post, even in print. I personally initially viewed the photo capabilities of this camera as kind of like my not professional photos or just for thumbnails or stuff like that. But the more I use it, it's a very viable camera for all sorts of situations in the photo world as well. So I really like that it's a great overall camera. I'm definitely using it more as a video camera because that's what it is in my eyes, but it's don't disregard the photo capabilities of this camera either. It's quite impressive. So overall, this camera is the best camera on the market in my opinion. It does everything well. It is so versatile. The sensor is absolutely crazy. The sensor is so good in fact that Sony put it in two of their cinema cameras, the FX3 and the FX6. So clearly this is a cinema oriented camera 
in a mirrorless body. And that just means that you're getting all this power in a small, compact body that most of us are very familiar with. This camera stacks up very well against the competition. It's competing against the FX3 and the FX6 from Sony, the C500 Mark II and the C300 Mark III from Canon, the C70 from Canon, as well as the Red Komodo. And in my personal opinion, this camera blows all of those out of the water, especially for the bang for buck. But I think if you're looking for a more professional camera with more professional ports, the bigger cinema cameras are the way to go. And you're probably locked in to a certain brand. But if you're open to switching and you're a small run and gun shooter like I am, this camera is absolutely perfect. Like I said before, this is a very versatile camera. You can use it for running and gunning for YouTube, but you can also use it for client work, for documentaries, for weddings, for cinematography. It's just a great overall camera. And for the price, it's really hard to argue with the performance. And that's why I think this is the video camera for the masses. This is the best bang for buck that applies to the most people and it's just going to give you the best image quality. It's going to make your life easier. And at the end of the day, that's what this is, right? We pay a lot of money for tools that make our life easier as creatives. And this is exactly what this camera accomplishes. But I wanna know what you guys think. Are you excited about this camera? Do you already own it? Are you looking forward to buying it? Were you on the fence? Did this help you in any way? Let me know in the comment section down below. I always love to know your thoughts. My name is Mark Steiner, and I'll see you next time.